Hey everybody, I'm James and welcome to the Esprit Tech live stream episode 5. This week we're going to cover Opale Paramodels, uh, a little bit of Opale Paramodel programming, at least the way we do it on Jetty Radio. And then at the end we're going to get into a little bit of what's going on in the hobby and the things that we need to do as modelers to improve the situation. Uh, before we get into that, we want to talk a little bit about where we are with everything that's happening. We are, as everybody knows, a small company, uh, so we are very uh, insulated here as far as ourselves. So uh, we don't expect, barring any regulation from the state coming down, we don't expect to be leaving our post. So we will be here to answer your calls, answer your emails, and place your orders in the system for you. Uh, we will be shipping full rip until somebody stops shipping. So uh, as far as our product mix, uh, things like Opali Paramodel and Jetty. Uh, these are well-established companies with very, very good policies in place to protect them uh, and protect their markets. So they will continue to ship. Uh, although those countries are under restrictions, just like we are here in the U.S. right now, uh, they are shipping product. They are at their stations. They are working. Uh, so we have no fear of running out of product, either here or abroad. So we want to make sure you guys understand that we are, while we're being careful with everything that's going on, we are going to be here for you when you need us. So I want to get into a little bit about Opale Paramodels. Uh, it's a fantastic company that we paired up with a few years ago. Uh, they are out of France. Uh, we feel they are the strongest competitor in the segment uh, because of what they bring to the table. Uh, for anybody out there that hasn't flown a Paramodel or has never looked into it, has seen them and thought, oh, I don't want to mess with that. I want to get into a little bit about what they are, how they fly, what we offer from Opale. Uh, and then, of course, we'll get into a little bit of the quality, how they're built, what it takes to own one, set one up, fly one. Um, once we finish that, uh, I want to show you a video, which is really good. It has a lot of stuff in it uh, that we've shot ourselves here on the beach at a local uh, flying field, and as well as some stuff mixed in from the guys over in France. Uh, then we'll get into the programming and move on to the other segments. Um, to start out, what is a paramodel? Basically a powered parachute. Uh, it's what you're going to recognize or the term you're going to be comfortable with probably. Uh, it's very simple. It's a shaped airfoil wing made of fabric, suspended on a bridle uh, by high, high tension lines or uh, by lines uh, that are under tension, under weight, to help it keep its shape. Uh, air flowing both through, under, and over the wing is what gives it lift. Uh, very simply controlled. You have basically two control lines on the wing. Those are your braking lines. Uh, left turn, right turn, basically just by deforming the wing on that side. Kills the lift or defeats the lift on that side, and the wing turns to that side. You also have a little bit of braking. Uh, by pulling both of those lines, which drags that trailing edge down, uh, reducing the forward speed, increasing the lift, and allows it to bag out and come down. Uh, so you don't have an elevator on something like this. Uh, your elevator is controlled through the application of throttle. Uh, throttle affects the angle of attack, which increases or decreases uh, the angle of flight. And so it's just a little different for you airplane guys getting used to it. First thing you're going to want to do is launch it and grab the elevator. There isn't one. Uh, everything happens, basically, or can happen, the way I program, on one stick, which is your throttle, your left and right, uh, either a switch or the other stick for your braking. So they're really simple to set up. Uh, as far as what they offer, what we offer from Opali, uh, we have wings going from one half square meter all the way up to over five square meters. So to give you an idea, I believe that five, that over five square meter wing uh, has something uh, really close to a six meter span. So this is a very, very large model. Um, actually, uh, what I have here next to me is a setup with a full trike and a 5.2 meter wing. Um, you can see physically it's a lot smaller package than what you would have, say, in a six meter sailplane. So this is going to fit in pretty much any trunk. Uh, in the passenger seat in your little convertible. Uh, you could haul this around in your Ferrari if you've got one. 
uh, and you could still be out there flying a six meter aircraft basically. Uh, so they are a lot of fun. Uh, little half meter guys like this are really awesome to throw in your backpack, take to the beach with you. They pair up really well with the Jetty DS-12. Um, those of you that are already flying on the bigger Jetty transmitters, uh, want something fun to play with out in the park, grab your DS-12, uh, get one on order, get it out to you. Uh, it makes a really great backup radio. It makes a really awesome beach or hiking or, you know, small model radio to have. Uh, I've just added one for myself, so really nice to have. But they do range, again, from half meter all the way up over five meter square. Um, things like this in the center. So run through a little bit about what makes them up. So you always have a power system in, in the powered models. Uh, like this one. Uh, usually your power system will be attached to a backpack that's usually made out of either G10 or carbon or metal. Uh, most of the ones that we do are either G10 uh, or a metal frame like this one. Uh, you have either a pilot like we have here uh, which is what activates the lines uh, or you can have a servo holder mounted on the backpack uh, that rather than, than flying a pilot, you would just have servo with long arms that pull those lines. That gives you space if you wanted to do something like a GoPro. Um, on top of that, you would have the pilot would have a harness, which is where he sits or what he sits in inside the backpack. It's where your batteries would go, where your electronics would go. Uh, and then, of course, you have your wing. Uh, very, very simple to set up, very simple to operate. I'm going to go ahead and, and open a new wing and give you guys an idea of a little bit of a, you know, what you'll have. Because one of the things I've noticed a lot of people ask, especially if I'm out flying one of these, uh, is how do you keep the lines managed? You know, uh, a lot of people are afraid that when they order one of these, they're going to have to tie a bunch of knots and manage a bunch of, of lines and and that just isn't the case. The only thing that you ever have to tie yourself, uh, barring, you know, damaging a line, and we don't even recommend you do it yourself. We recommend you send it back. Line repairs are fairly inexpensive for, for us to do here. I'm very experienced in doing them, so we take care of that for you. It's a little better for you. Um, but when you get a wing, you really, the only thing you're managing is those breaking lines. And the only thing you're going to want to do is make sure they're equal, make sure you have a a nice C-shape, a nice amount of slack when the wing is in flight and you're not putting any inputs in. That's the best way to look for a tuned wing. It's going to fly straight. As it goes by, the trailing edge is nice and relaxed. The braking lines are nice and relaxed. So opening a wing, they all come in a very nice little bag. Makes it nice to tuck away when you're finished flying at the end of the day. It keeps them nice and clean. Keeps all the, uh, you know, the dust and damage and everything from happening to them. Uh, not like you have to worry about hanging a rash with something like this. Uh, but it is nice to keep them clean. Uh, in a typical setup, you are going to get a little bit of extra line for you people that do want to do your own line repairs. You will get uh, a little bit of each of the types of line. You will get a patch in each of the colors of the wing. This is a, a, an adhesive patch made out of the same ripstop nylon material. Uh, each of those colors is graded. Each of the materials is slightly different. Definitely want to use the right patch on the right piece of material. If you get damage to a wing that's larger than what you can cover with, with what came in the kit, you definitely want to reach out to us and we can get you that material from Opale. So go ahead and set that to the side. When the wing comes, it is folded up better than you will ever fold it up again. Uh, but never worry, uh, there's not a whole lot to them. So when you open up the wing, and I'm not going to open it all the way up, obviously, this is a one and a half meter wing. I just don't have the space for it. But one of the things I want to talk about is managing the wing itself. So once you get the wing open, um, and if we could go to the overhead real quick, I want, to, I want to give you a little bit better idea on what we're looking at here. Good. So let me grab my remote, and I'm going to back out a little bit for you guys. All right, perfect. So I'm going to pull this down. So all of the lines are pre-tied on what we call bridles. So each one of these bridles has terminations for each one of the lines. Uh, this bridle would attach to the backpack or to the pilot or uh, for whichever system you were flying um, and would never need to be managed. These lines are tied in a very specific length. Um, 
each line has to be within one millimeter of its uh, preferred length in order for the wing to make its shape. Um, everything is stitched inside of itself, so there's no knots. You don't see these lines being tied. I keep using the word tied, but they're not. They're stitched. Uh, they're also stitched at the other end uh, into the wing surface. Uh, one of the things to get into with that is once these lines are attached, so either of these bridles would go down, um, you physically cannot tangle these lines. These lines are attached at two points. It makes a U. You cannot tangle a U. You can spin it in itself a hundred times and spend 10, 15 minutes unwinding it, but that is about the most you can do. The only time that these lines can physically become tangled is while they are disconnected like they are here. Uh, when your kit ships, it comes just like this, so your best bet, lay your wing out just like I've done, take your two bridles, separate them, uh, which is going to be really important. Set your vehicle right on top. Make sure the orientation is correct. Leading edge, trailing edge, and attach them directly to the carabiners or, or the uh, clevises that are on the backpack. Once you've attached that, you can't tangle this wing up. Doesn't matter how you fold it up or what you do with it, you're not going to make a mess. Uh, when they arrive, you'll see that the braking lines are tied off on the bridle. You would simply untie those from the bridle once you had them attached to the backpack, run them as instructed in the manual, and tie them off either to the pilot's hands or to the arms uh, if you were using the, the servo set instead of the pilot. Uh, a couple of differences in the available wings. You guys will notice on the site uh, we have a lot of wings available, and each of those has a couple of uh, distinct descriptions. And so there's three, three kinds of wing, technically. Uh, you have a single skin wing, a double skin wing, or a hybrid wing like what I'm working with here. Now I'm going to show this. It may be a little bit difficult online. But a single skin wing is like what you see. Let me get out of the, the shot here a little bit. Uh, the single skin wing is what you see here. Uh, so it's a single skin of fabric with the whale boning or ribbing to give it shape. Uh, without a second layer. A double skin wing, like what you see in the extremely high performance wings uh, for really experienced pilots, uh, would consist of a top layer ribbing and then a second layer of fabric where air flows between the two layers to inflate the wing. That requires a, a much more accomplished pilot because that wing has to maintain a good amount of forward speed uh, the angle of attack has to be correct so that that wing always stays full and inflated. Uh, and then, of course, when we go on to the last one, a hybrid wing like what we have here. So you'll notice that this is a single skin wing with a few cells that are stitched in double skin. Uh, this gives you kind of the best of, both, best, best of both worlds. This is an easy to inflate wing. A single skin wing is much easier to inflate or launch. Uh, because you don't have to worry about air going through it, just air against it, it'll fold, fill the wing. As the pressure increases, the wing will rise, comes overhead, and you launch the wing. But it does have the added benefit of those closed cells for that rigidity in the wing, the shape of the wing, and the performance of the wing. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the hybrids. I think they have absolutely changed uh, what we're able to do with these. Um, I'm a really big fan, actually, when I get phone calls, people want to know where they start. I get, I get that a lot, too. Uh, let, me, let me sidestep a little bit. If you've never flown a wing, even if you're the guy that's got the biggest, coolest models on the block, don't go for a 5-meter wing to start with. A uh, 5-meter wing requires that you, one, know how to manage the wing itself, manage the lines. Uh, you have to be able to fold it when you're finished. You have to have space for it because uh, they do create, take quite a lot of space to launch and, 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 and inflate. And you're not really going to know how to manage the energy of the wing. Um, I always recommend starting with something like 1 meter to 2 meter range, so power 1.1, 1 .1, uh, hybrid camo 1.5, uh, hybrid 1.8, split 1.6. Uh, all of those wings are a really good size to start with. If you have an indoor place to train, or you're in an area where you get very low wind on a regular basis, something like the little 0.5, the little half meter, uh, is probably the most fun you're ever going to have, and you may never move back up again. 
Uh, once you're experienced with the smaller wing, uh, that one to two meter wing, absolutely make the leap, go for the bigger wing. Um, but we don't want you to get into that kind of investment without knowing how to manage it and then getting discouraged and feeling like you spent a bunch of money and it, and it just doesn't fly right. Well, you really need to learn how to fly the vehicle, how to manage the energy. You, the way that these hold their shape is by the weight hanging underneath it. And so if you think about that, you have a wing that's holding air and a large heavy weight below it, there's a lot of pendulum that can happen. Um, and so that's what I mean by managing the energy. Uh, when you first get out there, if you're really ham-fisted on the throttle, the thing's gonna swing back and forth. If you're too lightly loaded for conditions, it's gonna bounce around. So there is a little bit of a learning curve. Start that learning curve on something that's a little more manageable. Uh, go with something like this Camel Hybrid 1.5. Um, set it up, you know, however you want to set it up. You want to set it up in a backpack with a pilot. You want to set it up in the light chassis with a servo setup and throw a camera on it and an extra battery. Um, any of those are fine, but start on the smaller wings. I think you're going to have a lot more fun. Uh, you're going to get a lot less discouraged. Um, and then you will start buying other wings. We have customers now that have bought every wing that they've come out with um, because they do end up being a little bit of an addiction. It does not fly the same as anything else. It can be extremely relaxing. Uh, it can be extremely aerobatic. If you buy a small wing and fly it towards the top of the weight range, especially if you get into one of the, the, the high performers uh, like the Power 1.1. And the other thing I'm showing you is folding the wing. There's not a whole lot of consideration or care when you're folding the wing. A couple things to be aware of. As you're folding, there is ribbing, hard ribbing in the leading edge of the wing. Uh, you don't want to fold that. You want that to lay nice and flat. Um, so if you pleat the wing as you're folding it, that really makes it nice. Even if you roll the wing, just be rolling it large enough to where those, that, that ribbing can lay down flat on top of each other and you won't damage the wing. Uh, they're very, very durable though. So it's one of those things where if it starts blowing like crazy and you get the thing on the ground and it's just blowing too much to get, it, to get the wing folded up, grab both sets of lines, run your hand all the way out to the wing. That allows you to manage that wing, get it to the car, put it in the trunk just like it is, put it in the back seat just like it is, take it home, lay it on the kitchen table and fold it up. It doesn't take a lot to fold the wing. It's not like, you know, one of the parachutes where you have to fold it super tight and super specific so that it'll open again. Uh, this just has to be folded neatly so that you can get it back in the bag and so you can take it out and fly it again next time and it's not had any wear and tear on it. But again, this is the Camo Hybrid 1.5, uh, a really great wing to start on, a really great wing to fly. Some guys, like myself, uh, don't ever leave the 1.8, 1.5 size just because the wing does everything. It's very good aerobatically. It looks very scale in the air. Uh, it doesn't take a lot to manage. I can throw my Hybrid 1.8 in my radio and a couple extra batteries in a backpack and take it to the field. No muss, no fuss fly for a couple of hours and go home. So I particularly like that size. Uh, if you're up for the challenge, sure, move up to one of the big ones. Um, you can set up the 5.2 meter with the trike and a one meter tall full scale pilot that actually operates the lines, just like you would in the smaller ones. Uh, that is a fantastic scale model. Uh, something like that is really great. I've got guys around the country that have bought them from us that have rigged up lighting systems, camera systems, doing some really amazing things with them. So what I want to do now is I want you guys to go ahead and watch a little bit of a video that we put together. This is a compilation of some amazing flying, uh, a little bit of the range, uh, and you see some of the different kinds of flying that you can do with them. So if you want to go ahead and sit back and watch that, I'll be back with you in just a couple minutes.
Everybody, uh, thanks for hanging out with us. I hope you enjoyed the video you just watched. Uh, some really good aerobatic flying from the owner of the company. Um, of course, some shots of me flying there at the beach uh, and a couple of the other guys here from the shop flying at different fields around the country. Uh, so some really cool stuff in there. Um, I want to get into a little bit about how you program and what they're supposed to do. Actually, we can go back to the main camera for just a moment. I'm going to bring this guy in. Okay, perfect. So with a paramodel, uh, when you're in flight, the position of the arms, because um, we have this question as well from guys that buy them, uh, should be overhead. Uh, that is your flying position without an input. Uh, when you do your programming, uh, you do not want to start in the middle and have one arm go up and one arm go down. Uh, the wing will not fly as well. You'll have a lot more uh, big ears, stalled corners. Um, so you do want to make sure the hands are overhead. Uh, when one arm comes down, only one arm moves at a time and goes back to its position under braking. Both arms move down equally. So that's very important. And I want to talk to you about how you do that. There's two ways. One is going to be programming. and I'm going to set this off to the side here. One of them is going to be in programming uh, in your transmitter. Uh, so you do need a little bit of programming capability. You're not going to take um, kind of a really entry-level transmitter and do that programming. Uh, when you're in that situation, uh, we do offer a device called the Paramixer. Uh, makes it very easy for you guys. You set the airplane up as a typical four-channel airplane, uh, throttle, aileron, elevator, rudder. Uh, you plug the two servos into the, the Paramixer. Uh, the two outputs from the paramixer go into your throttle and aileron channels. It handles all of the programming duty or mixing duty uh, that we, you would handle in a radio and a higher end system. Um, now, for you guys that do have a lot of programming, there's a couple things that you need to do. One is you're going to need to extend your travel out so that you get as much movement on the arms as you can. Uh, the other is going to be uh, either flight mode trimming or sub trimming, depending on the transmitter you're using. Uh, those arms to that full upright position in rest so that the uh, arms only move in the down direction. Uh, the opposite arm doesn't move up or reflex when you're pulling that arm down. A um, couple of other things I want to show you, uh, but I'll show you those actually in our programming or how we set the transmitters up, which would be a little different. So I'm going to go ahead and go to an overhead shot. And I'm going to show you how we set it up with Jetty. So in our transmitters, I've already got it set up. What I want to do is I want to kind of walk through uh, the programming a little bit um, and explain each of the screens and why we set them up that way. So we're going to jump into the menu and we're going to go into model. And I want to start with our basic properties. And you'll see I set this up. I named it hybrid. Uh, I did set it up with... Actually, let me do one thing. I want to, let's, 
I'm going to go back one here. There we go. That way you guys should be able to see. Uh, Jason, how are we looking on that? Okay, perfect, guys. Um, you'll see that I set that up. I did name it hybrid. First thing you want to do is you're going to set it up for wing type to aileron. And then for tail type, you're going to set that up for none. You're going to set up as an Elevon Delta. Uh, down below that, you're going to set it up for a single engine. Uh, next thing we're going to worry about is the function assignment tab. Uh, in function assignment, you'll see that um, by my preference, I assign my primary flight controls, that would be my left and right turning capability and my throttle, uh, all to my left stick. Uh, that's because I launch with my right hand and I want to have corrective capability as I launch. Um, I tried setting up in a traditional system with my elevators, my braking, my ailerons as my control, all of that on the, the right stick. Uh, unfortunately, um, it is not as easy to manage, especially if you get a little bit of swirly wind while you're trying to launch. It's nice to be able to guide that wing as it comes over top uh, as you release it. So for me, the way I program is I set the ailerons and the throttle up on the left stick. Uh, my elevator, uh, which is my braking, I just don't rename that in the system because you need that later for mixing, so leave it as it is. But So my ailerons, throttle, those are on my left stick. My braking is on my right stick. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next screen. Servo assignment is going to be typical. You're going to see throttle, aileron, and aileron 1, aileron 2. Rudder is going to preset there. Doesn't matter whether you leave it assigned, take it out, unless you have something else you need to plug into that channel, it's not going to affect you. So I've left it there. Servo setup is going to be important. Uh, remember I said that you're going to need to max out the throw in one direction. Uh, so what we've done is we're going to go ahead and go from throttle to our ailerons. You'll see that we have assigned 150% in the positive side. Uh, 125 in the neg negative side for my left aileron and in my right aileron we have done the opposite we've done plus 125 and minus 150. Uh, what that does is that gives us a little bigger range of travel especially in that downward direction so that we can get good full deflection on the wing uh, when we put an input in. Uh, so that's going to be everything that you're going to focus on in the model part of the setup. So you're going to say, again, you're going to set it up as a, an airplane model, name it what you want to. You're going to give it a two aileron wing, a delta elevon tail, and a single engine. Assign the sticks how you're comfortable. If you want to try assigning them traditionally, aileron and elevator on the right, throttle and rudder on the left, you may. Uh, I just will give you the pre-notice that I found it much easier to fly on a single stick uh, for my primary controls. The only thing that happens in my right hand is my braking, and I'm never using the braking during launch, so it works out much better. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into my fine-tuning menu. A couple of things that we've done here. Uh, one of those, if you go into your flight mode trim, I have set my elevator trim, uh, flight mode trim, to 100% positive. Uh, what that means is in elevator, or on the elevator axis, those arms are only going to move in the down direction. Again, this was part of setting it up for braking. Uh, you don't want you know, the braking to kind of go up and down. You want it to start in that, that upright arm position and go fully to the bottom uh, lowered arm position when you pull that brake, and you want that to happen equally. Again, that's going to be a lot of stuff having to do with your sub trim, making sure your sub trim's equalized between the two servos, and then using that flight mode trim to get everything kind of trimmed out how you want it. Uh, but again, in your flight mode trim, set the elevator maxed out to the up position so that when you pull the stick, it only moves in one position. Uh, from there, I'm going to go into function curves because we did uh, in elevator do another thing to prevent that movement. Uh, which was to create a curve that is a three-point curve. And if I go into that curve, you'll see that my point one in the curve is 100 or, or minus 100 on the in. That's where my stick is. Uh, and my output is also at minus 100, so that's a, a zero. But as the stick travels, uh, it goes to the zero in, which is center of the stick position, um, and 100% out. 
So basically, this curve allows nothing to happen uh, outside of that downward direction. So even if I push my elevator forward, nothing happens. I pull the ele elevator back, it pulls on the braking, I increase the lift, increase the drag, and the wing comes down. So it is uh, very critical to your setup that you do add this curve, this function curve, if you're flying jetty, that you add this function curve into your paramodel setup or paramodel programming. Uh, so we'll get out of there. Next screen I want to talk about is going to be our differential. I set it up for 125 on both sides uh, so that we can get all the over travel we want to for our aileron function. And our delta elevon mix, make sure that you've set this. It defaults to 50% in either direction. You want to make sure that you set your delta elevon mixing uh, to 100% on both elevators, 100% on both sides on the rudder. Uh, that way you're getting full movement both on the ailerons and on the elevator, which is going to be your braking. Uh, if you were to leave that to 50-50, uh, or tune that to a small number like you would on a Delta Elevon airplane. Um, you do that because you don't want to have nearly as much flap as you, or elevator as you do aileron. In this model, you want them equalized. So don't forget in your Delta Elevon mix, set them both to 100%. And then as far as the model goes, that really is uh, all that you're going to have to set up. There are a couple of variations to that. One is going to be if you run uh, one of the models with speed bar. Speed bar is uh, two additional servos in the model that allows you to slightly droop the leading edge, uh, which allows it to penetrate a little better. Uh, this is something that I don't recommend uh, for entry level or even intermediate pilots. Uh, once you are very comfortable with these types of models and have flown uh, the high performance versions uh, like the Fox Racing Wing, uh, absolutely you're going to want to use speed bar. And in the normal models, uh, all of the models that we fly here in the shop, we fly without the speed bar. If you're flying in the right conditions for the wing, you're not going to need it to penetrate anyway. Uh, patience is the, w is the biggest thing that you're going to need. Uh, if you're having a hard time penetrating, is just remember how they fly, what makes them fly. Um, and have a little patience because they do things in their own time. It's definitely not like a, a, a sport plane or an aerobatic plane. Uh, you throw a throttle to speed it up. It definitely doesn't work this way. So that's one of the only differences that you're going to get into, into in the programming is if you're running the speed bar. Uh, there's not a lot to the programming. It doesn't look like a lot, uh, but what we have found is the basic radios you just can't get enough out of the radio to really get the performance. If you're one of those, um, you order the package, you don't think you need a mixer, you get it and you're unable to program, uh, spend the extra money, put another order in, get the paramixer, and save yourself a lot of headache. If you're flying Jetty model, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. I can send you a copy of the para program. Uh, we, did, we wouldn't want you just to bind that to the model. Uh, because your, your servos may be reversed, there may be things that keep that from working in your particular model. But we can send it to you and it makes a fantastic template for you to look at and, and see how to program. So that's the basis for setting up your paramo paramodel in the transmitter. Um, I have another video on a watch. Uh, this is a release video for a new product for Opali. Uh, so I'd love for you guys just to sit back and enjoy that. Um, take a peek and we'll be right back with you.
love that video. Those guys did a great job getting out to an unbelievable location. What a job, really, to get to travel to places like that and just do what you love and fly. Uh, the guys from Opali are fantastic about making sure they're still out in the field flying these things. Um, speaking of which, kind of what we want to get into a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about the state of our hobby. Uh, some of the stuff that we as modelers on the whole are up against um, and some of, of course, just my opinion about what led us to this point uh, and what we need to do going forward. Um, the biggest thing I notice, and I think everybody in the industry has noticed, is we've seen a decline uh, in the number of new pilots coming into the industry. Uh, it seemed like for a while there, uh, when, the, when the park flyers came, you know, we had this fantastic influx of new pilots. Uh, but unfortunately, what was happening was those guys weren't joining clubs. They weren't becoming part of a community. Uh, they were buying a model, going to the field, flying. Uh, some of them would crash right off the bat and they'd be out of the hobby. Some would continue. Uh, but not everybody stayed in it, obviously. Um, and I think that is what was missing, or one of the things that was missing, uh, is that the club element, that community element, uh, wasn't there with a lot of those guys. Um, typically, what we saw happen locally is they would start to develop a little community based around a park and they would be flying, something would happen, they would have an incident and they would be thrown out of the park and now that community's gone. These guys are finding little lots and things to fly in. Um, you recommend they join the AMA, you recommend they join a club and they weren't, you know, seeing a need for that because they could just go fly in the local park. Um, that I think contributed to one of the things is we lost a lot of those pilots. One of the things that, that I think and I noticed myself directly as a parent, um, was that too few of us as modelers bring our families into the hobby. And that doesn't mean, you know, your yearly trip to Joe Nall, which is an amazing uh, vacation for the family. It's an awesome flying event, one of my favorite places to be. Um, but it means your regular Sunday event, your regular Saturday trip to the flying field. Um, you know, I. I tried to do my part, you know, my children fly, but not everybody, it seems, did. My kids would typically be the only kids at my club. Uh, my son made his first airplane at four. The whole club was there, standing around him, watching him take his maiden. It was a huge moment for him. I think too many of us have been, as modelers, uh, have been a little greedy with our hobby. Uh, it's been the me time situation, and we didn't want to bring our families into it because it was our escape from our families. Uh, but in the end, that costs us uh, because all of us, myself included, are getting older. Uh, we have every day guys leaving the hobby because they're no longer able to go and stand at the field and fly. They're no longer able to look up at the airplane. They lose their vision. They're not able to see the airplane anymore. They lose the enjoyment of it. Well, once that person's gone, that pipeline has to be filled. And without us taking a bigger part in this and reaching out to communities, reaching out to schools, bringing kids into the hobby, uh, we will not have a hobby. Uh, our hobby is threatened every day, as everybody watching knows. Uh, we have the FAA working against us. Um, unintentionally, of course, I mean, we're collateral damage in a bigger picture scenario, but uh, it does not mean that we're not going to be affected. Uh, so as we're being threatened with losing the ability to do what we love to do without a huge uh, new expense to ourselves, um, we're also not filling that pipeline of new pilots. Um, one of the things that we need to make sure that we're doing as clubs, as modelers, is getting out into the community at large, the non-modeler community, um, and doing things to bring this hobby to the next generation. Uh, there's a lot of really good STEM programs out there. Um, if you're somebody that's just retired, spends a lot of time flying, or has a lot of time, uh, reach out to your local elementary school. Find out if they have a STEM program. Ask them if they'd be interested in bringing in a couple members of the club to talk to those kids about model aviation and aviation in general. 
uh, especially guys that are either retired aviation engineers, retired pilots. These teachers, these instructors want you in that, in that classroom. They want your expertise passed on to these kids. The only way that's going to happen is if you're reaching out in your community and making a difference. Um, if I'm upsetting anybody, it's, this is obviously my opinion on things, um, but as a modeler, you know, going from the old way where things were very expensive, you had to build them yourself, uh, so there was a very select group of people in the hobby. We passed through a fantastic period where we opened the hobby to everybody. And the problem was is, is we didn't go out there and make sure that we were building the next step. So now we're seeing the, the repercussions and the fallback from that. Uh, if this was a larger hobby in general, uh, I think that our position, uh, our, 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 our little battle, if you want, with the FAA uh, would be fought from a much stronger position. Uh, you know, if one in four kids was out flying uh, and needed this hobby as a way to move forward, I don't think the FAA would be so strong, uh, or I don't know if that's the word, but I do think it would, it, they would have a little more empathy towards us as a group. Uh, and do things that they needed to to write their guidelines around the hobby. Uh, again, just my two cents. I'm really glad those of you that are on stuck around to listen. Uh, if you want to debate it, if you have any comments, don't hesitate to reach out to me, james at espritech.com, sales at espritech.com. Uh, if you like the video, you like what we're putting out there, you know, just pound that subscribe button, hit that like, uh, tell your friends to come on and watch every week. We did have some problems with week four, so that, that week went away. The material that's in that week will be covered again for you, those of you that didn't see our train wreck. I'm really glad, but uh, keep an eye out because we will we'll be kind of going back over those topics in later episodes. Thanks for hanging out with me this week, and we'll see you next week.